Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Don't Risk It podcast presented by VFIS Client Risk Solutions. This program focuses on the exposures our clients frequently encounter and discusses some potential solutions to help reduce these exposures. I'm your host, Chris Rogers, with VFIS Client Risk Solutions, and today we're discussing psychiatric transport vehicles and how they're used by emergency services. I want to welcome Jerry Schramm from Lancaster EMS. Jerry is the Director of Operations for Lancaster EMS, and he's joining us today to talk about how his organization has integrated these vehicles into their fleet. Jerry, I want to thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Yes, sir. So prior to the introduction of your vehicle dedicated to psychiatric transports, how did you handle these type of transports? Well, traditionally, like many services, we transported uh, voluntary and involuntary mental health um, by ambulance. Um, on a stretcher, uh, secured, um, uh, not the most economic way of doing it, and, and certainly not, uh, not the best way for a patient as far as uh, just a comfortable ride. Um, ambulances aren't the best way to be able to transport. So, you know, what drove the decision to implement the, the mental health transport? I think you just kind of hit on that, but were there some other factors? Yeah, well, it, we had a number of providers that were just becoming fatigued. We were pulling an ambulance out of service, taking it out for two, three, four hours at a time. Um, those ambulances were better utilized running 911 calls uh, locally, um, driving back and forth to uh, to Philadelphia, to State College, and some other distant places. Uh, they just weren't the uh, – people were starting to get fatigued, just a lot of, of hours and miles on the road. Uh, and we looked and said, is there a better way of doing this? And that really was um, what, what prompted us. It was, it was staff members that were just growing fatigued and, and just overutilizing the resources. And that kind of pushed us and said, is there a better method? And when we started to explore the sedan, we said, my goodness, is, it's not only easier on our staff, but it's more economical as well. So fatigue's it's, it's a trendy word in, in EMS right now. It's something that's being focused on. Have you all noticed a, uh, 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 an improvement in the fatigue of the crew by uh, dedicating that unit? Uh, we have. Fatigue, as you said, is a, is a buzzword right now. Uh, everybody's going through fatigue. Uh, there's just a, a crazy call volume, and everyone is just, uh, you know, it's downtime is, is at a premium. So the, the idea of shifting over to one person in a sedan versus two people in an ambulance and dedicating people specifically for the mental health uh, car, I think that that has uh, certainly alleviated some of the fatigue of these three, four, five transports a shift to Philadelphia. Um, so, so what types of transports uh, or what types of patients do you transport? And you mentioned Philadelphia. Is that as far as you go or, or would you go further than that? Uh, we go much further. Uh, we'll be in the Delaware. We'll be at Pittsburgh. Um, we'll go further up north, Wilkesboro, Scranton. So we do take, uh, take a trip. Um, Philadelphia is not uh, the, the only location, but it's one of the ones that we go to most often. So why don't you do involuntary mental health admissions or transports? So we looked at both voluntary and involuntarily early on when we were building out this program, and it was a big transition. It was a transition going from the traditional idea of everyone going by ambulance, um, not only for the sending facility, but the receiving facility. They weren't used to EMS coming in without a stretcher. Of course, police could walk a patient in, but it wasn't something that they were familiar with. So um, we tried to take some baby steps initially, and we said we'll start off with just the voluntary they can walk through. Um, one of the biggest reservations from the receiving facilities was walking someone through a locked unit. So they weren't necessarily willing to buy in, at least initially, to the concept. On the safety side, we were not necessarily comfortable with just a single driver um, to, to um, be able to manage an involuntary patient on their own. Uh, we don't uh, have our providers uh, chase or restrain anyone who attempts to, uh, to elope or, or somebody who becomes aggressive. So we felt that from the receiving facility being uncomfortable, walking patients through a locked unit, and the safety of our providers um, staying with the voluntary uh, transports was best for us. When you say sedan, I think of uh, my grandmother's Buick Century. So uh, I don't know if that's the type of vehicle you're referring to. So, you know, can you clear that up? What type of vehicles do you all use for this service? So when we built this out, we, were, we wanted to make sure that safety was first and foremost. So we looked at uh, what vehicle was, was most economic and which vehicle could we uh, develop that put some sort of a barrier between the, the driver and between the rear passenger. And the first thing that popped was uh, police cars, cars that are designed for, for police cars, something that was already built out that a plexiglass divider could be put in between the front and, and rear. 
Uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, Ford Explorer is a popular one. They're able to be outfitted as police cars. And then Ford Taurus and, and Dodge Chargers were the other two sedans. You can outfit them for pretty much any sedan, but the things that were stock and already designed for that were those vehicles. Um, we went with, uh, with discounts we get through Ford CoStars. Uh, we went with the Ford Taurus sedan, and uh, we now have two of them, and they work fantastic for us. Were there any modifications that or changes that you had to make to the interior, exterior of the vehicle in order to, uh, to get them ready for a psychiatric transport? Well, uh, luckily, um, selecting from one of those two vehicle designs, they come stock available as police cars. So we didn't have to tran transfer much or, or make any modifications that would be out of the norm from saying, can you please build this out like a police car? We put the divider in. Um, we have the the, uh, the doors that don't open from the inside and the rear. Um, we, we also added a, uh, a drive camera that records audio and video for the transport. We thought that was important. The topic of um, uh, whether you need a same-sex driver passenger came up, and uh, you always want to have that prevention and if there was any, any, any accusations. So you wanted to be prepared for that. So we put the drive camera in. It records audio and video, and it also is there as its intended purpose as a drive camera in case there's any incident. And then we upload all of the information. We keep it for two to three weeks after just in case there was any allegations or incidents and we haven't had any issue. Um, we also went the additional step and we said, um, this vehicle, we have mental health transports, but initially when we rolled it out, we had EMT drivers. And we said, what if that EMT driver was returning from a transport and came across a vehicle accident or, or there was a medical emergency? What could they do? And we said, we should probably outfit this to be able to handle those medical emergencies, which was a win-win because making this transition in these baby steps, our partners bought right into the concept. They said, wait, we're going to have a medical trained professional, an EMT driver with a full complement of medical equipment in case something were to happen on the transport. So again, win-win for us. So because we were already outfitting it now with medical equipment, we said, take the additional step, get it licensed through the state as a QRS, so now the vehicle is not only um, able to do mental health transports with the PUC, but it's also licensed by the Department of Health to respond as a QRS. So with that, we had to meet all the requirements from DOH to make it a QRS. So I was going to follow up with, are there any specific licenses or, or permits that are required? But um, it sounds like for your organization, it's a requirement to be an EMT. But uh, do you know if, if, say that you all didn't have that, is there any licenses that, that the, the state re would require to do this type of transport? So the interesting part, so if I, if I step back a second, um, we started with an EMT driver and a full complement of equipment. And we put the mental health sedan in service in July of 2016. In December of 2021, we had some conversation over whether after all of these years of doing that, all of the data that we had, do we truly need an EMT driver or could we have someone who's trained in de-escalation, somebody who's trained in first aid and CPR operate the vehicle. We talked with our partners. We had a few meetings. Our partners were acceptable as long as we did what we said. We had everyone trained to that point. They were comfortable with a non-EMT driver. We put that in place in the uh, late 2021, and we've had um, drivers who were non-EMTs since that point, and we've had no issues. So, so we do have um, non-EMT drivers now. As far as what's required, so the, the interesting part is that we don't, while we use the term patients kind of loosely, we term wheelchair uh, passengers to be patients, but they're not necessarily patients because in the state of Pennsylvania, if you need observation, if you need monitoring, if you need treatment in any way, then you have to go in a licensed Department of Health vehicle which takes away a wheelchair van or takes away a mental health sedan because there's just a driver. There's nobody tending to that patient, observing, treating the patient. So what we do is we make sure that the patient is properly vetted by the sending facility. The physician needs to clear that patient, that that patient needs no monitoring, needs no observation, needs no treatment. Otherwise, the person could be discharged on their own, drive by taxi cab to a facility. However, we provide that white glove approach. This person does need transport, needs secure transport to a facility, but doesn't need those other things that would constitute it being in a Department of Health vehicle. So with that, it defers to the PUC, which is very much like a limousine or a taxi cab. So as long as we have the facility properly vetting those patients, that they don't need any of those particular observations or treatments, 
then we refer back to the PUC and they're the guidelines we use. So it's more the the facility that makes the determination on who's going to qualify or not qualify for the for the sedan transport versus your organization, or do you all uh, qualify or non-qualify people as well? So it's the facility that's making, the sending facility makes that determination, but we do have some parameters in place and we say what does and what does not go by a sedan. And it really walks that line between what needs observation and what doesn't. We put a couple of other factors in. The sedan does have limitations. If you're uh, an, an offensive tackle for the NFL at six foot eight, 350 pounds, you're probably not going to fit in the back of the sedan, at least not be comfortable in the back of the sedan. So we do have a few, a few stipulations on what does and does not go, but it is the sending facility that's going to vet that patient. So what are some of the policies or procedures that you all have as part of this program? It sounds like you just went over a couple of them, but uh, if, can, is there any more that you want to elaborate on? Sure. Uh, we do have a couple of different parameters that we have with the sedan. Um, we go through, we have a policy, and we've built that out to try and think of everything. But inherently, you're never going to think of everything. There are always going to be things that crop up. The first thing we do is what qualifies and what doesn't qualify. Generally, the person has to be over the age of 18, but we do take minors as long as we're going to have the parent go along with or have specific things in place. The facility understands that a minor is coming. Um, the parents are acceptable. All the appropriate paperwork is signed. But um, we focus on over the age of 18, um, somebody who can't, um, who has to be able to ambulate to and from the vehicle. Um, if they've had sedatives at any point, they still have to be able to um, manage themselves, be able to sit up straight, keep the seatbelt on for the duration of the transport, be able to uh, verbalize and communicate with the driver. Um, we're going to make sure that nobody who has a medical condition that's going to be exacerbated during the, uh, the transport, somebody who's able to sit for upwards of four hours. We never know uh, a two-hour transport could turn into four hours if you get stuck in construction. So uh, we make sure that that's in place. And then we have a few other things in our policy that deal with vehicle breakdowns, medical emergencies that happen to the patient or to the driver, and, uh, and general vehicle maintenance, you know, something that might happen along the way. Do you mind kind of expanding on one of those that you just mentioned? Um, what happens if a medical emergency does take place uh, during the transport? So if a medical emergency takes place, the first thing they're meant to do is to pull over, stop the vehicle, put your hazards on, um, phone for help. That's important. And then we have all of our, all of our drivers are trained in de-escalation, trained in first aid and CPR. So they're expected to provide whatever level of training that they're comfortable providing to assist that patient until help arrives. Once help arrives, they notify the supervisor of what happened. They're going to transfer care to the appropriate EMS agency. And they're always going to want to request law enforcement in addition to ambulance. These patients are otherwise voluntary admissions, but there's still some legal constraints that exist there. So you want to have law enforcement on scene just to make sure that everything is done appropriately and notify the sending facility that the patient was otherwise redirected. Are there any paperwork requirements or do you complete a PCR? Or kind of how, how, how do you document these transports? We do complete a PCR. Our PCR is very similar to what we would do for a wheelchair transport. It's a little bit deeper than demographics, but generally you're keeping demographic information, you're keeping miles, and then you're going to also make sure that you put um, some information in your narrative that the patient met all of those that criteria that we require for the sedan transport. They were properly vetted by a physician. They were deemed to be appropriate for the sedan. And then you put who you transferred the patient to when you arrive at the receiving facility and get your appropriate signatures. Is there, is there a similar QA, QI, QI process that would go with a you know, 911 uh, PCR uh, for, the, for the mental health side? We generally um, audit 30% of all of our, our PCRs that are completed. So not every um, sedan transport is audited. Of course, we did that in the beginning when we had this process is still in its infancy. But after all of these years and processes, we're just grabbing 30% of those that are transported. It's, it's not a separate program. It's integrated into your overall uh, quality assurance program. That's correct. Awesome. Well, Jerry, I really appreciate your time today. It was a pleasure talking uh, talking with you, and thank you for inviting us down to, to your facility. It was, a, like I said, it was a pleasure. Absolutely, and thank you.
And I want to thank you for listening to the program today and for your interest in VFIS safety resources. I want to thank our guest, Jerry Schramm, once again for his time and information. Please consider subscribing to our program to stay up to date on new content releases. Also, if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review below. For more information about the many resources available from VFIS, please visit VFIS.com. And to submit ideas for future discussions, please reach out by email at VFISriskcontrol at VFIS.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Gladfelter Insurance Group, VFIS, and its employees. Additionally, all views, information, or opinions expressed are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal, medical, or other professional advice on any subject matter.